Hello and welcome to another amazing episode of Creative Appetite. Today I'm joined by my good friend Aaron Craig. He is an artist, more specifically in pop culture or pop art, however you'd like to describe that one. Um, he's, he specialises more in like cartoon-based style paintings and digital content. And we have we met uh, we met at your art show, and then we played against each other in Oztag. Funnily enough, Scott, we can try right on you. Yeah, <laughs> you probably Scott still hurts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been I've been very excited to get you on. It's been a long time coming, and uh, yeah, I just I'm super keen to hear what you got to say for yourself. Cool, thanks for having me. No, my pleasure. These. Podcasts are always so weird because you never know how they can go. Like sometimes you can get people on and it ends up kind of being a little bit more like an interview and then yeah. other times it it just rolls on to like these deep conversations and you're like, I don't even know when people are listening if they're going to find anything that I'm saying interesting or the <laughs> other person. But because you just don't, there's like no gauge to yeah. what you can and can't say. Like you, As long as you don't say anything hurtful or like obviously upset people's feelings. But in terms of like what you... Because this is open forum, the conversation could go anywhere. Like yeah, we could yeah. end up talking about, I don't know, your favourite hobby or something that isn't art. even remotely <laughs> cool, like yeah. that isn't art. Yeah, that isn't art. Yeah, yeah. I mean? yeah, yeah. The the podcasts I've done before have been really structured towards like question answer, question mm. answer. You know, they j- they tend to go off track at some point. So yeah, I, I think you can really help that. I just don't like that format. I find it very yeah not authentic. Yeah. Because then it's just like me trying to get something out of you without, and then you're just there, like, all right, I'll answer yeah. this, I'll answer that. Like, there's no real connection, I guess, you could share with someone if they were like just asking you blatant questions. I mean, like, in it. Unless it's educational. Yeah, or something then like that. Then you're like, yeah. You need, you're trying to get information. Which makes sense. Like, if, if I was a scientist or something, and I'd be like, all right, what's up? Like, um, definitely not a scientist. The Huberman Lab. He's really, he's a neuroscientist. Yeah, okay. Uh, and he's like, he's super smart. He yeah. just talks about. He's different things like anxiety and like how to retrain your brain and like sl- why sleep's so good for you and morning routines and alcohol and blah, 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 all that good stuff. Yeah. Check it out, by the way. Just shouting him out for no reason. Right. Good on you. <laughs> 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 but let's get more down to what you do. Where did this like, where? I find art is so subjective. Where everyone says art is subjective. So when you, when you started, I'm assuming you started drawing through school and things like that. Was there ever a point where you just, you realise that, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. I should probably continue on. Um, yeah, I mean, I always found drawing was, was like the thing I'd always did as a kid. If I had spare time, I'd be drawing. Um, if I was in my room, I'd be drawing, you know. Um, I think it's like one of those weird things. Like when you're in primary school, like I remember people saying, oh, you're really good at like drawing. And it was like, wow, that's like a skill of mine. It's, like, it's probably like the, w- the first thing that I realised I had a skill in just because like other kids at school would tell you or like um, or ask you to like draw something for them or whatever. Um, so it's kind of weird in that regard. I mean, I just did it anyway because I liked it. And I think because like when I was a kid, I was so uh, into cartoons, like I loved them. Like, loved, loved them. And, like, this is back when, like, you know, there was, like, VHS videos. So, like, How you, good is you, VHS? you know, you'd go to, like, we had Civic Video up the road from our house and, like, we'd go there once a week and I think you could get, like, seven, seven, like, videos for $7. Yeah, like, and you had to, I remember. You had, like, you had to, like, bring them back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you didn't rewind them, you got a fine and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, the, for me, like, when other when I'd go there with like my family, I'd always try and pressure everyone to get like cartoons, like Disney cartoons, and like just all this obscure stuff. So, um, yeah, like that was I was just so heavily involved in 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 that, and that's all I wanted to do, and that's all I drew. <clears throat> so it's kind of been it's been a natural transition to where I am now. But I'm I turned forty this year, not yet, but later in the year, and so it's probably taken a long time from like, my love as a kid to then become my full-time career. Does that make sense? Because I've yeah, only been, yeah. like, a full-time artist for a couple of years. Like, a lot of people think I've been painting for years and showing for years, I, which I haven't. Like, it's only been, like, it's coming up to four years 
I think in October or the start of November, four years from when I like made the decision that that's it, I'm going to be a full time artist from now. What were you doing before you went full time? Um, my wife and I owned uh, espresso bars, so I was a barista. Um, the, cl- <laughs> the classic, the classic artist. Oh no, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's sort like of a- like I, I owned an art company, like. I own an art company um, called Stupid Crap that's been around for a long time in Australia. So, like, I think since, like, 2007. Oh, so, yeah, okay. So, it's been sort of pretty heavily rooted in the Australian art scene. I've owned it since 2014. Um, so, I, I, like, I still did that part-time. Like, it was just a part-time gig. Um, I still own it now. Um, but I did that. That was sort of, like, my um, toe in the water of the art scene, if that makes sense. But I wasn't doing any of my own art at that time. Um, and so then we had, like, my wife and I had a, an espresso bar here on the Sunshine Coast, and then we sold that after owning it for, like, four years, and then we moved back to Newcastle, where I'm from, and opened another one there, and then I was just like, what have we done? <laughs> you know, like, you, you know right away. We, we only opened it because we were like, we, we know how to do this. We've already done it before. So it was kind of like, well, let's just do that. But not really, I think... Um, you know, honouring the reason that you sold the one in the first place. You know, we sold yeah. one for a reason and then went, travelled a bit and then like six months later opened another one in a new locate, like in a new city and we were just like, oh, like the setup of it was awesome, you know, like doing all the fit out and all that because it's creative, right? Yeah. And you're making a space that people are going to enjoy and it looked phenomenal but, you know, all the other elements which are probably more important than the look of the place, we just had no passion for. And so we were just like, this sucks. And so we we sold it within, I think, nine months of opening it, which was lucky. Yeah, I kind of feel that a little bit like that as well. I'm working in a job that I knew, like I know how to do, I guess, if that makes sense. But it's not, I'm only doing it because it provides me money and it equal time off. But it's not something that I truly just want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of, yeah. Similar to, I guess, where you were at that point in this, like, crossroads of going, why the hell am I... Like, why don't I just somehow make this podcast a full-time gig but not really knowing how? So you kind of sit in this weird limbo stage of, like, oh... Yeah. I know I'm not being authentic to myself, but I also don't want to live on the street. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> That's important. <laughs> so you're you like, know. ooh. Yeah, I think that, like... So many people work for money, you know, and that money then provides them with hopefully something. You know, if you're going to do a job that you don't love, you're doing it for money, you would think, or some sort of perk, and then that should then give you something relevant and important in another element of your life. So, like, you know, if you get paid really well but you hate your job, um, then you should be able to buy things that make you happy or travel or whatever else. You know what I mean? It should provide yeah, you with something. Like, yeah. You can't just do a job that takes all your hours of your day, you know, for nothing and provides you no joy for nothing. And so many people do that. And I think that's just sort of the – I think that's the route from school. Like, I think that that's sort of like a hangover of a school system that doesn't really, you know, cater for modern-day Australians or people. You know what I mean? Like, who yeah, wants to – the whole going from, like – primary school to high school to straight into university into a full-time career that you're supposed to spend at least, you know, your life in or 20 years in and then, you know, go, oh, shit, you know, oh, it's too late to leave now because I've moved up the chain a bit and I'm a well, manager yeah. or whatever, you know, like you kind of get stuck, you don't want to start from scratch again. So there's so many people like my age, so like 40, that even friends of mine that, you know, I grew up with that, that did that whole system and then moved to Sydney and worked for big corporations and stuff. And they all own, you know, really nice houses and stuff now, but a lot of them are actually starting to take the side hustles, like the things that they really enjoy um, more seriously and try and get it, make it a job. Similar to what you're saying about the podcast, you know, like yeah. it, I think it's only a matter of time. You can only do what you don't love for a period of time without it just crushing you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's like, it's, it's this weird, it's, I, don't, I can't speak on other countries because I obviously didn't grow up in them but I, I know for a fact that like in Australian culture like where, when I grew up in the like early 90s I'm real old hey <laughs> turn 30 next year Woo. 
Um, yeah, like my parents or like the running narrative was that it was like go to school, go to uni, get a job, provide for your family, die. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was yeah, like, yeah. where is the enjoyment out of that? And how, I guess like from, a, it's a different period of time from like when my parents, I guess, grew up and their parents and, and it's, it's kind of like trickled down from like this hard working kind of career thing, I guess, that society has pushed on it. But it seems these days that more people are inclined to be happy working at a cafe as long as they get the opportunity to work on their own creative side projects which is great yeah but th- for me personally there's like this underlining oh shit there's going to come a point where i'm not going to be able to support myself and i don't want to be on the pension yeah yeah and then the cost of living is getting so expensive that like i can't i couldn't i couldn't actually do this podcast full time because i don't get paid for it so i'd be like ah, oh. like so you, you're in this like weird tossing and turning of like how do i make this project sustainable without like, but also getting ahead financially, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, or surviving financially. Yeah, like, yeah, you're just trying to survive. Yeah. And you're like, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to afford to buy a house. So you scratch that one out. And then yeah. you're like, well, I need to do some type of investing yeah. because the pension's not going to be around. And it's not like I've, I've my grandparents. Well, I'm the pension's not going to afford you to be able to live no, the like, way you want to live. Yeah, and I've heard know. about like how yeah, terrible. I think it's like a couple of hundred bucks a week. Yeah, it's not much. It's like, yeah. How do you Old people that? apparently don't need to, you know, eat yeah. or do anything fun. Just just <laughs> sit crack, in your house. Crackers and cookies in, in the newspaper. Yeah, apparently. It sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty I think it's super outdated. Um I think the whole school system is really outdated. Like even from when I so after I went through like high school and I was one of the people who was like, I don't know what I want to do and I'm I don't want to do a corporate job. So I didn't go to university straight from school. Like I ended up um spending a few years in the snow. Um, down in Jindabyne, living down there, um, and then moved to Brisbane for a bit. But then after that, I just travelled. Like, I moved to San Diego and from there up to Canada um, and did a lot of travelling sort of around, like, Central America and North America um, before I came back. And it was sort of, like, the catalyst for me starting, like, taking that step into art in my adult life because from when I was probably 17... I stopped drawing and doing a lot of art just because you know, just prefer to do other things. Yeah. Um, you sort of outgrow it. You think it's a bit kiddy. And so, like, I didn't really do much until I was in Canada. I was working as a landscaper of all things and I was a snowplow driver in the winter. And uh, a friend of mine over there, she it was a high school, t- uh, a primary school art teacher and she just had some canvases in her house. She's like, do you want these canvases? Like, I know you like art. And I was like... Okay, yeah, sure. So she just gave me some canvas she had laying around. I did these paintings on them. Just stuff that's very different to what I paint now. But we had this um, sort of big share house um, that I lived in with some friends and we had this guy move in and um, he had a bit of money and he's like, who did all these paintings? And they were like, oh, as I did. And, um, and he's like, he, he wanted to buy them all. He like bought so many paintings off me. That's crazy. He he bought enough art of me that it afforded me to move home to Australia. So, like, I was ready to leave Canada at that point. I'd been there for nearly three years. And, um, yeah, it was sort of like working on $12 an hour as a landscaper. It's pretty hard to save, <laughs> save up. Plus, they <laughs> love the booze over there. So, you, you know, you're always, like, out doing stuff. And, um, you know, it's a pretty social sort of environment. And so you don't want to miss out on all the fun, but then you've got to get home. So, he, yeah, he bought all these paintings off me and um, I was able to buy a ticket back to Australia. So that's how I ended up moving home. And from then, when I, when I got home, I decided that I was going to study fine art. So I started going to the uni of Newcastle. So, like, I did a completely different, like, I sort of found my path in a weird way. Like, I, was, I disregarded tertiary education completely and was just travelling when, you know, sort of happenstance came along and someone said here's some canvases and then someone randomly moved in and wanted to buy them so it's it's kind of weird and that was enough of a you know a kickstart for me to go oh maybe i'll go study this at uni but i mean I've, since then my path's gone very <laughs> different like i didn't even end up i got i have a degree in viscom design instead of fine arts anyway so i ended up changing to graphic design and doing a whole bunch of different stuff but that was kind of the catalyst but that's, that's only going back to 2008 or something. And 
so that's not that long ago. And I'll, if, I, if that was me now, I wouldn't go to university because there's no reason to go to university for any anything creative, in my opinion, at least. Because I think you can learn as much or more online for free um, than you can from university without all the filler. So, like, I could just learn the skills that I have today in a year of doing it myself rather than four years of university yeah, to, get a, to get a certificate that I've literally never showed one person. Even when I was going for jobs, like graphic design jobs, after I got my degree, no one asked for it. Like, everyone was just like, all right, sit down, show us what you can do. Here's a, you know, here's a task. Do that show, and show me. It's all about that. So, it's just like, it's kind of this pointless thing. And I remember I was, um, I posted online something about um, getting a degree and whatever a few years ago. And someone um, in the art scene wrote back, oh, we call people like you fools or whatever. And I was like, oh, burn. Like, it kind of like made me really mad. <laughs> but then... Now, in hindsight, I'm like, oh, she was totally right. Like, it is a, it's maybe not at that time, but now I think if you're going to university for something creative, I think if you have the motivation yourself, you can do it without any debt <laughs> to begin yeah. with. So no hex debt, you know, faster, and, it, like, you could do it at your own pace. You can learn so quick. So when you have all this stuff piled onto it, like, you know, art history or... She, parts of it that you're not interested in or, at all, but you have to do it because it's mandatory and then it's still a unit that they're charging you for. Like, it's still debt. Yeah, it's stupid. For something you don't even want to do, yeah. but, but it's part of the course. You know, it seems like a crazy way to spend your time. Yeah. If you could just pick and choose the elements that actually make sense to you and that you want to use. You know, like, imagine being like, oh, I'm going to spend a year learning how to use Procreate really well. And, like, imagine the cool stuff you could create after a year. Yeah, I really struggled with um, I really struggled with school. Uh, and I still kind of... I, I, I kind of struggle with authority figures as well. And I, fe- I felt like school was kind of like jail for me. Like, it didn't really <laughs> allow me to be, my, be myself because of the structure that was in place. Yeah. And then, on top of that, you got, like just your classic like normal things in school like the popular kids and this and that and coming from a country town it was very very hard to like be creative without being judged if that makes sense yeah where I feel like in cities in Sydney and stuff like that it's it's much more acceptable now and probably back then as well to be creative like people were like kind of into it but like if you come from a country town it's like Ooh. maybe there's more kids and there's more exposure in <coughs> cities you know what i mean like yeah if you're from a country town you know it's rough yeah it's, <laughs> it's, a di- it's different you yeah know? um so different interests yes yeah, you know imagine if you're funny. from a full farming thing and you were just like oh, i want to be an animator and people were just like what get well, your head out of the clouds literally, yeah literally now <laughs> like even <laughs> i'm not gonna rag on my uncle but <laughs> was the other day I was having a conversation with my uncle who lives on the coast and I was like, he's like, oh, mate, what have you been up to? Rah, rah, rah. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, working up in Darwin, blah, 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 but also like, still doing the podcast. He's like, you're still doing that podcast? Oh, yeah. Like, Why are you wasting your time? Like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, like it was just like something that was going to fade out. Yeah. It's like, God damn, uncle. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this is serious. Take me serious. Yeah. But it's just funny because like the generational gap and w- of what they consider to be like success to what I really want to do is like they're so different, and yeah. like I, I've always I don't know if you struggle with your parents in that kind of like because you would have come from, yeah, I guess the same type of um, environment, and it was like when you like I tell my parents what I want to do, like I was like oh, I want to be an actor and I want to be this, like all these creative stuff growing up, and then I got the podcast, and they're just kind of like they're like oh yeah yeah, yeah. like they never like they never think about no it one nurtures it yeah they don't yeah, think yeah. that it's possible yeah they're like all right yeah cool like, and that's a shame you know like I think. What you're saying about um, at school, like feeling like, you know, you sort of can't do anything creative or whatever without being judged. I think that's that's just the school system. You know, you mm. as soon as your kids start school, and it starts when they're you know four or five, and you have to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> like kids, it's so goes against everything that kids want to do naturally. They don't want to sit in one spot. Try and get a five year old to sit down and be quiet, and then like don't give their opinion and stuff. You know what I mean? It's like. It's pretty um, restrictive, I think, particularly on creative growth. You know, and there has to be specific times that you can, I guess, express yourself. And 
Yeah, it's uh, a really weird concept. The structure is really... Uh, look, I, I send my kids to normal you know, school. I'm not like a woo-woo parent, but... And he's good. No. But, but like, I, I would have no issues with, you know, if there was different options available that weren't, you know, the, the normal structure of school because I don't think that it... Um, I don't think that it really, you know, tends to to kids' strengths at all because everyone's all in the same boat, you know, same the, the same rough people that yeah. you went to school with that grew up in that community and were happy to stay there and following their parents' footsteps or whatever. Uh, you're being treated in the same box as them because that's just everyone's in that box. It's like a sc- uh, school to me was a way to dull out your creativity and like, do you remember like as a kid growing up, you used to you were quite happy just to sit in the dirt with your toy cars or Barbie dolls or whatever you were, girl or boy or whatever, and you'd just be so happy and you'd just sit there in your own imagination playing around. And then as you grew up, school and, like, life and all these things start happening and no, and you, like, forget and you start losing that imagination. And then when you become an adult, it seems more uncomfortable to sit there with your toy cars and, like, hang around. Or, like, just want to be creative and imaginative because, like, social structures have, like, in my opinion, have crush that as you get older and you just forget to be creative and then all of a sudden you're concerned about oh i've got to go to family and oh, i've got to get this all because that was drilled into your head as a kid yeah and it just slowly just dulls your i get what you're saying i'm that the opposite of that though yeah well, because i i do cartoons you do it now but <laughs> i mean cartoons really but i also have like a huge action figure collection and like when i uh when my kids were born like my son's first toy was like um leech from masters of the universe which was a Toy I had as a kid in like 1985, you know. Um, so it's like I, I understand that that's the way it's done for pretty much everyone, but you still have a choice to sort of do your own thing. And for, like I said, for me, I only made that choice four years ago, so I was 35. Yeah, so, you know, and that's what I mean. Like I think it, it takes a while to to sort of feel comfortable. I think doing your own thing. It's like you go full circle. Like you just you're like, why am I? you like, everyone's running the same race until you, you kind of get to a point where you realise, you're like, why am I, why am I running this race? Like, yeah. I, I don't even like this race. Like, yeah. this is shit. Exactly. Like, <laughs> I, I didn't even remember when I started the race. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's on. right. You just, you just naturally get, everyone just gets shuffled in the little, and then, because that's how I feel now, even, for me, like, I've always been, I've always felt that I, something just wasn't right, and I was always trying and pushing for something, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what it is creatively that I'm going to find, but eventually I'm going to find it. And I always just had that drive to figure out what the hell was going to happen. Yeah. And then I found the podcast and I was like, oh, oh here we go. Like, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Like I said, multiple other episodes. But, yeah, just kind of like what you were touching on when you, like, four years ago, you're like, oh, you know what? This is ex- this is what I wanted, like, what I, what I would like to do. Did you ever get have that feeling in your gut where, every like, all that noise just went silent? So what I mean by that is, like, when I found this podcast, I had all these, I used to have all these, like, something just doesn't feel right creatively. Like, I, I love what I'm doing, but I know this isn't going to be long-term and blah, 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 all those kind of, like, negative um, thoughts. But then when I found this podcast, something just, like, changed and all those all that negativity went away and then I felt, like, this sense of relief and I was like, you know what, I can sustain this long-term because it's enjoyable every single moment. Mm. in every aspect of the like the whole creative project itself yeah i think that's what what everyone's looking for as well like that exactly what you're saying and when you find it it's awesome for me like i had a aha uh-huh moment and i mean you know like i said i'd already been already owned an art company at the time and i was curating a lot of shows with a lot of artists and stuff i kind of just got fed up with dealing with a lot of other artists because uh most artists don't take art seriously or their art, and I think it's also a hangover from, you know, people saying to them their whole lives, you can't make a career out of art, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's, which is just not true. Um, so my aha moment was, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty full on, but, um, you know, it's kind of got me to where I am now. So like almost four years ago now, um, I was diagnosed with cancer and like a really rare form of cancer, and um, and it was I got told in this really fucked up way. So like I was I had surgery. It was in my it's actually in my painting elbow as well. So which is crazy. So it's in my right elbow. I'm right handed. Um, I had this cyst in my cyst in my elbow for like 
three years, which I'd had scans on, had everything checked out, and it came back as like, no, nah, it's just a cyst. And so they put me on like this surgery list, um, like low level, like not important. It's just sort of when we get to you, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do surgery. And after we sold our espresso bar here on the sunny coast, we travelled around Europe and then moved back to Newcastle. And I, <coughs> I transferred hospitals at that time. And the guy I went to see down there was just like, how long have you been waiting for this basic surgery? And I said, oh, like three years, three and a half years. And he's like, what the hell? Like, we'll get that out. I'll get it out for you the next three months. So I ended up having surgery. And it was like a couple of weeks after surgery, I went back in to get like, I don't know, bandages changed or something. And they, they were like, oh, just sit down here. The surgeon needs to come and talk to you. And I was like, oh, I got to, I just had like the worst feeling. Like straight away, I was just like, something's wrong. I remember texting my wife being like, something's up, like the surgeon wants to come talk to me. I, he's, I have to wait for him to get out of surgery that he's in. It was just like this whole like, the stress, what the hell blah. is happening? Like I didn't, I never even thought about cancer. It wasn't even in my mind. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even know it was a possibility. And um, yeah, anyway, he ended up coming down. He was like, oh, we, we ran tests on the thing that we took out. It was the size of a golf ball. Yeah, it was big. Plus like your elbow was just like... In like, down. yeah, in the joint of my elbow. So like I had like limited movement and stuff. It would ache all the time, but... You know, I just kind of dealt with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, and he's like, oh, we did tests on it. It's not good. And I'm like, oh, man, this is the worst. This is by myself while I'm just <laughs> going for a routine bandage change on my way home from work. And um, and he's like, oh, it came back as cancer. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? He's like, it's not good. We've, I'll put you in touch with the specialists in Sydney. It's a really aggressive type. I'm sending you now for blood work and all that. And I was just like... Zero yeah, I was zero. like, I almost yeah. just disappeared into like, you know what I mean? Like I was so shocked that I almost felt like I died. You know what I mean? Like I was just like, I'm not even here anymore. What the hell's going on? Just, yeah, I vaguely remember the rest of it from that day. But as soon as I got back in the car, I was like obviously in tears. I was like, we, our, my second son was two weeks old. You know, we had this coffee shop that we hated in Newcastle and like just things just weren't, weren't working out. And we missed the coast a lot. So in that, when I was driving home back to see my wife from the hospital, I made a decision in that in the car that if I only had up to three years left to live, that I wanted to go to the beach every day, spend as much time as I can with my family, and paint every day. And that was it. That were the three decisions, and, and move back to the coast. That was it. So by the beach. So I made like three choices in the car, and they all happened within four months of that. So the next day we put our business on the market to sell it. We started um, planning to move back to the Sunshine Coast. Um, yeah, got rid of the cafe, got rid of our jobs. And we, yeah, within four months we were back up here on the sunny coast. Got a rental like straight away, right by the beach. And from that day I've just been a, an artist. So it's like... I literally do that. I wake up in the morning. Um, I do like, do you need to change <laughs> that? No, we've got nine minutes. Oh, you see? Mate, <laughs> I'm letting you I go. thought you were like waiting to go. <laughs> no, no, I'm just like gripping at the <laughs> sea. I'm like, man, this is intense. I love it. It's yeah. so cool. So it was just like, um, yeah, we're back on the coast. Got a rental. Um, you know, I, I started painting and I started painting the thing, like not worrying about what I was painting. Like when I was doing a bit of art in between while I was running the art company, I always, like, never knew what to paint. Like, you know, it's what's cool at the moment. Oh, women's faces. And you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you try to, like, look at the trends. And you're like, oh. Yeah, what's happening? And I'll, you know, I'll try and emulate that a little bit. But I was just like, I just want to paint what I like. So I just, like, back to the stuff I loved as a kid, teenager, like, cartoons. So I just started painting cartoons and, you know, worked on that. And from there, it's just grown, um, you know. And I'm super proud that I can be a full-time artist. Like, I can literally provide for my family my wife does a bit of online work but like I'm, I'm the breadwinner of a family we live 100 meters from the beach in Watala with two boys in school and um you know and that's all from just really having narrowed focus be in a dire situation you know thinking like shit I've only got x amount of time left on my life but these are the three things that are, are non-negotiable in my three years that I've left. And I mean, obviously, I'm fine now, by the way. 
Yeah, it's just like, and anyway, it's like yeah, two yeah. weeks left. And no, this is yours. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. Yeah. It's almost four years now, so I'm, I'm almost a year past what they gave me. And um, yeah, I'm, I still get checked every six months. And You're good to go. Um, yeah, there's been a few whoa, moments, as there is with probably everyone that's ever had cancer. But um, yeah, I'm sweet, happy, and healthy, and doing what I love. That's crazy. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm so glad to hear that you're still healthy, which is always a good thing isn't it interesting that it takes such a big moment yeah it's sad man. and it's like it's, it's such a heavy like we as humans don't have not obviously not all of us but some of us like a lot of us don't have the courage to be like like they know that in the back of their head they really want to do this thing that they just can't they yeah. just but they keep putting it off and they keep putting it off but then it takes something like that where it's like real heavy and they're like, wait a second, if I'm going to die very soon and I'm just, you know what, I've had enough, like I'm just going to go do exactly what I wanted to do anyway. Yeah. I try to put myself in those moments. Mm. Not, like I just, I sit there sometimes and I'm like, well, I'm like, do I really need, like do I really want to do that? Or Because I think that you don't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to go through something so crazy for that to change your life. Obviously some things you can't, you can't avoid that's why when i listen when i hear stories of people sharing things like this and i'm like oh that's pretty intense it gives me it like reinvigorates my uh drive and motivation to like stick with my creative project because i've been fortunate enough to like meet amazing people like yourself who have gone through crazy things and i'm like well if that's taken them that like that such, such a moment i should learn from that and just be like no you know what i should just like everyone should if that makes sense yeah. it's like it it's just a weird concept, like a weird thing that we always have to have something so drastic before your mindset changes. And yeah. I don't really understand that. I think it happens a lot. I mean, there's, it depends what you're willing to sacrifice, I think, because I think with, particularly with the creative industry, it can take a while. Like with the creative industry, a lot of it's really like self-motivated work. So there's not a lot of, opportunity to be employed by someone else who's going to pay you for your skills so you you, you find most creatives are self-employed you know what i mean um so i think a lot of it has to you have to sort of have that um willingness to sacrifice something which might be money or stability um but it really depends there's a, I, I also think about the other end of the scale like every creative conference i've ever been to there's always an artist on stage saying like, and they've been in bold, cool writing, like quit your day job or like <laughs> tell them to fuck <laughs> off or something. You know what I mean? It's like they're, they're real edgy and they're like, yeah. you know, I'm on the fringe of society and I just said, fuck you to the man and, and I just did my own thing. And it's like, that, that probably is true for that person, but that's not like the blanket rule for most people. Like, you know, uh, some people have a, a lot of obligations that don't warrant yeah. just going fuck it because, you know, you do need to keep a roof over your head or provide for your family or whatever. So there has to be some sort of boundary. Um, you know, if I didn't have a super supportive wife and, um, you know, another revenue stream in the art company that I owned, it wouldn't have been possible despite what I wanted, what I was like, this is what's happening. So I still had, I didn't just go that's it that i'm painting and from tomorrow i'm going to start making x amount a week it, it still is a, a build up but that gave me the you know the non-negotiable sort of courage to be like that this is what i'm doing from this day forward um but i still had obligations as a parent and as a husband um to not just be selfish with my time mm. um so yeah there is you still needed to focus on the creative part but you still i think there's just that moment, like what you were talking about before when you when you thought about the podcast and sort of everything went quiet and you sort of like you know deep down that that or something within that realm is, is really your calling. You just sort of have to work out the way that you can implement that to be the, the thing. And there's heaps of ways you can do it. You know, we live, we're living in the best time for any creatives at the moment. There's endless opportunities. Yeah, social media has definitely uh, provided... Social media is amazing. I mean, the internet's amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah, the nineties, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like for me personally when I when I 
just the way my brain thinks, I really like to get into the intricate details and like the one percent of how how something has kind of like worked out. So you did mention that you had those three non-negotiables, and then you did put the place up for like the cafe up for sale. Mm. What did that kind of look like behind doors? I guess with you and your partner when you're like, all right, this is what we want to do. Now, how do we kind of like move forward? Did you kind of set like small goals? That you were trying to achieve each month, or was was it your partner who was like, "All right, I'm I'm more of the organizer, so I'll kind of focus on that, and then you just focus on your art." Um, <coughs> well, we both hated our business, so that so selling it was an easy um, sell <laughs> because just we didn't want it. Just take it. Yeah, <laughs> like it's so for us it, because and because we had sold a uh, espresso bar before. So we'd already been down that, that route of selling a business. So it wasn't new to us. And we sold our own business up here. So we didn't use a broker. We used a broker, which didn't work out. So we ended up doing it ourselves way better. Um, so selling that wasn't the issue. Um, the issue was that it was so young. To, so trying to sell a business that's less than two years old is generally impossible. We actually got really lucky. So the person that bought the business didn't want the business. They wanted the building. That it was in, oh, and we'd signed a long-term yeah. lease. So they bought the business. The business is, doesn't exist anymore. They had to buy the business to get the building. So they were just loaded. They're like, oh, God damn it! They you're owned. S- you're the just building. like a stepping stone they, <laughs> for us to yeah. get something else. Well, so we, so when we, when we signed our lease, and I, we signed like five years or six years or something like that, or maybe it was nine years. I think it was three plus three plus three. So we had nine years in our favor. Um, and so the the people that owned the building sold it while we were tenants and the person that bought the building from them that I don't think realised that we had such a long lease. Oh, so they, they were kind of going in with the fact that they were like, uh, like in the guise that they would be able to just kick you out. Maybe, and yeah. Just move forward. And so we were like, nah, we've got this lease, but we want to leave. So if you buy, you can buy our business and you can have it back. And so that's kind of how that eventuated and that's what happened so far. So it was just this weird... All this weird stuff just really lined up and, and was very easy. Like, we were able to get out of our lives in a completely different city in a few months and be back up here. Um, so it was kind of like, I don't know, is serendipitous the word? I don't know if that's the thing. But it, whatever it was, it was just all these really weird coincidences that sort of just lined up and made everything very easy. So we, we knew that we were making the right decision. You know, we left the coast first. We lived here for eight, seven years, or seven or eight years before we left. And we left because we were bored of the Sunshine Coast because there's nothing yeah, to do here. Yeah, I'm starting to... That's where I'm kind of... So, and which is totally understandable, you know. We were in our, um, I guess, th- around 30, early 30s, and we were like, oh, man, we've had enough of the coast now. Like, there's nothing to do other than you know, outdoorsy stuff, which is awesome, and that's one of the coast strengths. But, you know, we lived in Brisbane, Sydney, Newcastle, overseas, San Diego, Toronto, wherever, Um previously so we were starting to get a bit tired of it but that's the exact reason that we wanted to come back as well like we were like all the reasons that we left the coast are what what we missed about it and that's why we wanted to return like i love that there's a really strong sense of community here um great place to raise kids the cost of living wasn't high i mean it's i know it's skyrocketed in the last couple of years but rentals were still cheap um you could live beachside for next to nothing and you literally spend all your time with friends family and outdoors it's all you do yeah, it's a great, um, it is a very, I, I love the coast for that as well. And I think it, but then there's like, for me coming from a city and things like that, it seems like there's just something, there's just something missing. Yeah. But and in there the same, is, but. but yeah. In, yeah, but in the same token, I guess, I think the creative scene is really strong. And it's, the more I dive into it and the more guests I get on, I realise that there's actually quite a fair few people mm. creatively on the coast but they're just really hard to find. Like, there's no one central hub just to have them all. That's the biggest issue with the creative scene on the coast. I've spoken to a few artists and, um, you know, organisations about that exact thing. It's the, the real issue is the coast is really sparse and because it does, have, like, as in, like, stretched out and, you know, travelling from Caloundra to Noosa is, like, 45, 50 minutes. So it's, it's a pretty long time. Yeah. You can get to Brisbane in, in an hour. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's, it's from Caloundra to Noosa is almost the same as going to Brisbane. Um, so I think that because it's so long and thin and there's no real central area and people are reluctant to travel, so, like, 
going from Caloundra to Maroochydore is a huge pain in the ass, but it's 20 minutes. Literally. <laughs> but everyone's like, I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? I went to, I think I went to, I live in Watala and I've been to Malulaba twice now, I think in the last year. It's 15 minutes up the road. Because I spent all crazy. my time between, say, Kiwana and Caloundra. See, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a sun, I'm a bit of a coaster, uh, little hooey. Because I just drive, like, obviously my studio is in Noosa, and then I drive, like, all over the joint. But I, I, I enjoy, like, shifting around and things yeah. like that. But, yeah. I think it's the mentality of, of creative, though. Like, it's and, – and I think it's the mentality of most people on the coast. You know, if you live south of the Maroochydore Bridge, you're going over the Maroochydore Bridge. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, <laughs> and the same thing. You, you know, I think, like, Noosa's got its own, like, sort of pocket, and then, like, the Coolum area's got its own pocket, Coolum, your Monday – and then, like, Maruchidor is the same thing. And then sort of, like, Kiwana to Kalandra yeah, is the it's same thing. Weird. It's really weird. <laughs> and so I think that, that that sort of attributes to the reason that creatives are hard to find here. Or it seems like the creative scene isn't very well nurtured because there's no real one area. And getting people to travel for shows and things like that can be tough. And it's very much the demographic here is older like more retiree yeah. kind of people. It's changing, though. It's but it? it does seem like it is more people are moving up to the coast. Yeah, like especially over COVID, I think. Like I can't rem- I can't remember the statistics on how many people moved in from Melbourne and like Sydney and stuff, but it was something ridiculous. Like, yeah, like yeah. they just come in and flooded the market and everything went up. Yeah, yeah, and then apparently they all left. That was the other thing. Like they moved up just through COVID, and then once co- COVID kind of went away, then they all went back to the city. Right. Because that's where all the work was obviously down there. Yeah. I mean, the infrastructure here is probably doesn't support the amount of people that are no. here. It'll get there. Yeah. yeah it's, I'm, I'm interested to see what's going to happen in like the next 10 years. Yeah. How Up until the Olympics. Yeah. The Brisbane Olympics. Oh, yeah. That's years. true. That's happening too. Yeah, in 10 years' time. Like even in Aura, if you look at Aura, the suburb just out of Caloundra, I remember when I first came here two years ago, you could only just see the tops of the houses. Yeah. And now you can pretty much. Like it's all sold the to highway. the highway. It's sold to the highway or that land. I think they're going over the highway and they're still going up further. That's what I've been yeah. told. I heard also that they've, they've approved like a corridor that basically runs the whole way from, or the highway from like Caboolture to the Sunshine Coast now. It's crazy. That is ridiculous. It's crazy times. It is. Cr- I mean, the co- like, if you live in Aura, you don't live on the coast. Sorry to anyone that lives in Aura. But like, if you've got to get in a car and travel like 20 minutes to the local beach... Yeah, you yeah, that's not it, coast living. No, nah. if you're going to move here from Melbourne, like fork out the big dollars and live beachside. Yeah, <laughs> that's a bit of <laughs> bit of local or going to local work local, local angst going yeah. on here. But don't do that because you know. <laughs> but, but that's your can't. sport. That's your sport, bro. Yeah. <laughs> don't come in. <laughs> <laughs> How did you? I want to try chat a little bit about NFTs because I, I I do keep an eye on what you get up to, and it does seem like you have been jumping into the NFT realm. I have no idea about NFTs, so can you kind of give me a little bit more of an explanation as to how your your uh, art fits into that section? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're like God oh, damn like it. The, the <laughs> NFT space, I think, is like it's so rapidly evolving that it's really difficult to stay on top of. So, like when I first got into it, I guess. 18 months ago, which I guess some people would call early. It's all this, like, nonsense. It's, it's a big non- nonsense realm, really. <laughs> like, that's all because it's all so fueled by Twitter and I feel like it's very young in, in terms of, like, a, most people that are heavily involved in it are quite young as well. So it's like all this, you know, if you're seeing this, you're early. All this, I hate all the crap banter yeah, like around the hype, it. Yeah, like hype beasting. I'm not in, yeah, totally. I'm not into it. But anyway, um, so I got into it because... A friend of mine um, from Melbourne who owned a gallery that I used to work at um, hit me up for a business opportunity and he was launching an NFT platform uh, or wanted to. And so he wanted me to go partners with him and launch a platform. Yeah, I think the the NFT world or just crypto in general is quite confusing. Yeah. Well, with the NFT space, so my mate GT uh, in Melbourne, he said, I want to launch a platform. At the time, there wasn't a lot of... NFT platforms, so like Nifty Gateway was the biggest one, um, you know, and they were sort of all invite only. Um, and then they, and then OpenSea was very young, but OpenSea was sort of like the eBay of NFTs. Like you didn't, there was no sort of curation 
You know what I mean? It was like yeah. opening a gallery and just letting anyone come put their shit on the wall. It's kind of like the way I viewed it. Um, which is awesome now. Like, it, it's the biggest one by far. But at the time, we are kind of like, oh, this is a bit naff. So, like, you either have these high-end people selling NFTs for, like, 10000 bucks each or you have, like, this sort of eBay style. So, we were going to launch our own NFT platform. So, that's kind of, like, how I had to get involved in it. Like, that's how I learned about it. And I, I had someone who is – they've just opened – or they're opening, like, the biggest NFT gallery in either Australia or the world in Collingwood. I just was there, like, last weekend and had a look. It's hectic. So good. And so that he's they're very, very involved in the NFT world still. So I had some, him as like sort of a mentor that was able to guide me through how it all worked and, you know, was able to show me how to set up wallets and you know, sell NFTs and whatnot. So I, I dip in and out of it over time because I've, I get frustrated with it and, it, and because I'm a painter, um, predominantly... I kind of I don't like making digital work. Like I use my digital work as like the basis for my physical work. So yeah. you kind of have to pick a lane and I get bored if I'm just doing, you know, digital all the time. So it's kind of like a digital painting and someone buys it and then they own it? Yeah, so it's called NFT's non fungible token. So basically it's like a one of one. So you then are given like the rights to do what you want with the it. ownership of it. Yeah. Um so yeah, the ownership's uh, transferred through the blockchain, so it's full, fully um, uh, traceable. You know, it's yeah. It's got it's like a it's like a digital commodity essentially. It's just a transaction, like yeah. between someone. Yeah. Okay. So, but the way I th- view it is, and at which I've said to everyone, like I've bought, I reckon, hundreds of NFTs over the last year or two, um, and spent big money on some, like went big money for me. So, like I think I spent like eight grand on one. Um, and that was a lot of money at the time. That's a lot of money all yeah, the time. I know, but I mean, <laughs> that's all I mean for me. <laughs> but I mean, like in compa- in comparison to like, to like well, they, you know, yeah. board apes or whatever that are worth millions. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, so that's just that's small change compared to the price of some of these NFTs. And um, and this is when like crypto was booming and stuff. So uh, I think like it it will always have its place, but it, because it's so, it's so rapidly evolving that I don't think that it knows what it is yet. So I think that it'll, I think that NFTs will have a, a a purpose in the future, but I don't know whether it will always be art. Um, but yeah, I make NFTs. I've released. Uh, I, I made a series. Um, I have a character that I've been drawing since I was a kid called G Grub, Georgie Grub, um, and so which I use in a lot of paintings now. So I made a full series of like Pokemon versions of him, um, and then released them. Sold a bunch. Didn't sell them all, but. Um, that was sort of like my releases and then I made some sort of one of one 3D rendered sort of animated ones as well that were super cool that were based on paintings from a show I had in Hong Kong. So that was like really special because... A show that you had. Yeah, so I had a solo show in Hong Kong, like an art, an art show and then oh. I used the, some of the paintings that I had from that show as the basis of the NFTs that I made um, and then I had them 3D rendered um, and then animated so they moved and there was sand. I got to add sound to an artwork, which is something I never thought I'd do. Because it's crazy. weird to get and go, oh, yeah. how's this artwork I've made? What would it sound like? And I get to like, you know, put all these like samples and stuff in. It was super cool. It was just an element of art making that I never thought I'd do because I'm a two-dimensional, well, three-dimensional, but paint, painter. So that was really cool. And then even one of those is then being made into a, an art toy. So I release art toys with a company out of Singapore every now and then. Um, and so we've made like this two-dimensional painting from um, my Hong Kong solo show then was made into a three-dimensional fully animated NFT with sound and now it's being made into a 3D art toy collectible bust. So it's kind of transitioned these three different elements. It's super cool. Like there's little moments like that that I'm like, oh, that's cool and like, you, you kind of get to reflect on the broad scope of what being an artist can be. Like, I am a painter, but I can also do all these other things if I want to. So you kind of don't have to stay that in box yourself, such a yeah. lane. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the funnest part of it. You know, you kind of get to explore these things. Yeah. So I didn't really explain what I am. <laughs> so it was very well. No, no, it doesn't matter. But There's yeah. so much more to unpack now. You give me so much to talk about. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, let's, let's go back. Let's... 
So let's talk about your art show because that's <laughs> stupidly. I was <laughs> when you like I had this show in Hong Kong. I was thinking like a TV show or something that you worked with. I was like, what? Yeah, imagine. But, I'm yeah. actually really big in Hong Kong. I'm like yeah, a celebrity. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite my the big own deal. Show. But yeah, so like, because like obviously having an art show is a massive, it's a massive achievement for any artist. So how, how what goes into an art show? Because I've never, I, I came to the one that like the art show that you ran, and I was like, man, this is sick. Yeah, had no money, so couldn't buy anything, but would love to buy some of the stu- some of the artists that you had on. But yeah, how like if it's your own personal show? Yeah, like that must that must be a massive sense of achievement slash like how do, what goes in what's involved in something like that? Um. Time, <laughs> a lot of time, planning, and a lot of painting. So for me, because because I'm a painter, um, painting, yeah. Like so, my first solo show was in Melbourne at Honeybones Gallery, and it was a gallery that um, another artist, uh, Jezra, down there owns. Um, and so, that was easy for me to have a solo show. I just had to shoot decide that I wanted a solo show because I knew the gallery owner and went, what dates can I book it out for? And then they, he takes commission like a gallery does. So most galleries take between 40 and 50% commission on work. 50 per- That's, That's a lot. 50, 50 is the standard, the industry standard. Really? Yeah. That's ridiculous. It's, yeah, it isn't though. That's, well, I can see both. That's uh, half of your... Money. Money. Yeah. And they've done nothing but give you a venue. No. So that well, that's not true. So this is my this is my uneducated yeah. opinion. I have not. This is why I want you to tell me because I don't know. I'll probably get killed for saying that. <laughs> so well, I can see from both perspectives because I run my art company. Stupid crap it is like a gallery, an online gallery. So and then when I curate shows, I also take fifty percent of everyone's work. So how does it? So the yeah. Noosa show, I get fifty percent of everything that sells. All that right. Can so you break that down because I don't because un- to me coming from a very uneducated yeah. art. So okay. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So most galleries function like. They have a space. Um, they have a lot of overheads, you know, you know electricity, staff, um, you know, planning, uh, advertising, um, big mailing lists. So that all has to be. So they take care for. of all of that, f- and yeah. then you just put you just provide they just your art. you just provide the art, and then the gallery uh, does everything. Okay. That's it. That's a proper gallery. So like when I send my when I do shows overseas, I don't even see the show. I physically don't go because they've all been during COVID. So I haven't even, I've actually, oh, I haven't you. been, I've had three solo shows. I haven't seen any of them. You just sent your stuff over then. That was I've it. seen photos, but I've never, I never, I didn't even go to the Melbourne one because they went into, they locked the state border. What? So I've never That's seen crazy. any of my three solo shows. And my fourth solo show will be LA next year and maybe I will go, or maybe I won't. I'm unvaxxed, so... Un- he's an unvaxxer poop. No. <laughs> <laughs> he's an anti-vaxxer. He's an anti-vaxxer. This guy. Uh, look at <laughs> uh, podcast over. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And, 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 <laughs> um, so it's uh, you know that's I would, I'd love to go and I, we have plans to do that, but uh, that depends on that. So maybe I won't even see my fourth solo show. But um, yeah, so most galleries will do take care of everything for you, and the payoff for an artist to give away essentially 50% of their earnings to the gallery is the gallery provides a platform that isn't available to you without the gallery. So um, showing in a city that I don't live in, you know, that's a perk. Um, New audiences. So most galleries have like a collected list of, you know, sometimes tens of thousands of people. That people that will consistently go to these places and buy the yeah, art. People buy from the gallery specifically or from the mailing list. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. They're, the gallery's putting your artwork in front of a lot of collectors that would never have heard of you without the gallery. And, <laughs> for example, like if it's, say, an art gallery that has shown X artist before you or, you know, has recurring shows with artists of high profile... It kind of bumps you up. Yeah, so it's kind of like, it's kinda like a, a music label. So, or like a music festival, for yeah, example. Okay. Like, oh, I, I was on the stage that Chili Peppers were on. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that gives you a bit of cred. Um, and so it's kind of about profile building. Um, and a lot of collectors want to know that you are serious and that you are going to still be around in a year or two or five or ten. That's a because really most people buy art as like a investment. 
believe it or not. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like They're, they're buying your art so that, that the value of your art goes up so then and the value of their investment that they paid $2,000 for a painting, if they did were to resell it, is now worth 5000 Yeah, And they've made money off your art. You know? And then going back to NFTs, that's where NFTs are different. So, like, if so I sell my NFT to someone and then they on-sell it, I still get a cut of that on-sell and on-sell and on-sell. I get a recurring payment. Yeah, that's right. You keep getting... Yeah, right. And you can set what that percentage is. Do you When you sell your art, once someone buys it, they own it, right? Like yeah. if it's just like a physical bit of art like this. Yeah. And then if they resell it, you don't get anything from it. No. Oh, uh, right. Because there's some... Art is very expensive. Can for, be. Like can be very expensive. Yeah, for sure. There's a guy that I like really, really love and I want to buy one of his paintings. His name's Thomas Sanchez. No, Toma, Tomas Sanchez. I hope I didn't butcher that. But anyway, I honestly think he is one of the greatest artists I've ever seen in my life. I'll, I'll have to show you his paintings, but they are so realistic and like the shadowing and the colours and the colour like grading or is that, that's not even that's what you call, but yeah, grading. it's insane. Like, and it just, it's just crazy to think that someone can be that, that good. I'm yeah. like, whoa, like it's, it's a skill and it's, and it's practice too. Like, no one's woken up in the morning and just gone, oh, like, hell, good painting. Like, oh, you know, God. obviously it's a skill that some people have, but it could be nurtured by anyone. You know what I mean? Like, That's what I believe. I believe that anyone everyone, can be everyone is talented. 100%. And if you, just, if you just invest your time and effort into it, then you will get better. Yeah. Just like this. Like, if you it's talk. It's going to take some people longer, but, you know, I think with, with painting, it's when people say, oh, man, you know, if stuff's so neat and, like, I don't know how you do that, so I'm like, you could do it. Just I'm, what I'm doing, you could do if you, if you spent time doing it, for sure. Like, uh, it's just a skill that I have that I do every day. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't... When I first started when I first started painting, like, after the whole scare and everything, I'm like, I'm going to be an artist. Like, I'll do all of the colours in acrylic. But then I was like, oh, I'm not good enough with a brush to get the really nice outlines. So I'd do it in, like, Posca... Um, like markers and stuff. I have no idea what that is. It's like a, they're like <laughs> art pens sort <laughs> okay. of thing. So Sorry. it's kind of like paint, but it's not paint. I'm real, yeah, really oblivious when yeah. it comes to. It doesn't matter. It's just like terminology. It's, it's, say for example, it's just like a paint pen, yeah, okay. for example, rather than a brush. Yep. Um. So I think the quality is not as good. I don't think the longevity of the piece would be there the same way as it would be for acrylic paint. So like I had to teach myself how to paint really fine like i paint really small now and like seamlessly because yeah, i've seen your reels and i'm like this yeah guy's smooth like butter yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's just practice you know what i mean like I, a few years ago i couldn't do that and i and i wasn't even confident enough to try but i was just like i need to learn how to do this so i made myself learn um just through practice so yeah but getting back to the gallery thing so like the what that's the way it works that that's the payoff for an artist is the exposure generally and sales and even if you don't get the sales from that show like for me like my hong kong show that i had that was not last year the year before or maybe it was, i can't remember now how long's covid been going for <laughs> too 29, long 2020 2020 yeah i remember because i was in a van in 2019 so it just started in 2020. 2020 i was on a boat i remember so i think the show was like end of 2020 then yeah i want to say that makes sense that was when it was really ramped up or beginning of 2021, maybe. I can't even remember. Anyway, whenever it was. It doesn't really matter. But, um, yeah, with that sort of thing, I can't even remember what I was going to say now. You just kind of... I don't even... Yeah, you just kind of happens. Yeah. So, yeah, that would say, like, this is, the, this is the amount of work we want. Send it to us. The Hong Kong stuff sold, like, pretty well for my first show, but... I remember the first day, I'm used to, when I curate shows, a lot of the stuff gets sold before the show's even on to a collector list. Whereas Hong Kong, I was so proud of the, the amount of work I did and like how beautiful the paintings were. Like I was really happy with that show. And I remember it was like day two and I was like, is that all that's sold? In my head, not to the gallery. Yeah. Like I wasn't like... You guys aren't doing your job. I was just like, is that it? I was like, oh, man. Because I'd had the Melbourne show before that and, like, 80% of it sold. Like, it would just sold really fast. And so I was expecting something similar, but 
I'd never shown in Hong Kong. I didn't. No, no one in Hong Kong knew who what I was. Yeah. You know, I'm some guy from Australia that's now showing at this gallery, and um, and the gallery said to me like, oh, with people in Ho- from Hong Kong, like we have less wall space, and with a lot of Asian countries, so people are very selective about the art they buy. You know, they don't just buy and put in drawers, or they don't have heaps of wall space for for stuff. So she said a lot of people will want to uh, be very considerate before they decide to buy something or they'll wait for your second show there to make sure that you Allergy. aren't dipping in, dipping out. Yeah. Um, and then you, your second show will sell really, really well. And so with that show, yeah, they were, they were epic. Like um, a lot of it ended up selling, but it was like a week into the show, not on day one, which is generally what happens. Um, so, yeah, that show sold out, ended up selling out completely in the long run. Um, you know, so that was all like a full learning experience because I'd never shown overseas and particularly in like a foreign country and stuff. Where they yeah, that's crazy. Speak different language. A, um, like, yeah, it's wild. And that happens everywhere. Like I ended up doing, I did a Taiwan show, a show in Taipei this year, this year. And the same sort of thing happened there. And that was the weirdest, I'll tell you this story because this is pretty crazy. So there's this French curator who curates these shows for all these galleries around the world. Like, he's got, like, sort of these partnerships with galleries in, I feel like, every country. And now reminds, that reminds me of um, the guy out of Zoolander, Will Ferrell, where he's, like, running around. He's like, oh, my God. But, oh, he's, <laughs> he's like a fashion bike. <laughs> oh, yeah, Mugatu. <laughs> yeah. Mugatu, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just instant thought in my head. I was like, that must yeah, be Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he's this, yeah, he's this um, cool French dude, super nice, and... Um, and the, I, he had partnered with this uh, gallery in London that, and he said, we want to do a show with you. And I was like, oh, amazing. I'd love to show in London. And we had planned to go there, but then COVID and all that. And so I painted this basically this entire show, ready to ship it. And they're like, oh, okay, we've had to change the venue to this other gallery. And I'm like, what the hell? Why? And the gallery I was showing at was just right in Brick Lane. Like, if you know yeah, it's like London, it's amazing. Yeah. It's like perfect spot. And I was like so happy about it. But... Um, they said, oh, the upstairs tenant from the gallery flooded their place and so it flooded the gallery and so they can't show in there until it's all repaired. And, um, and they said, we've got this other space for you. It's amazing. It's in the bottom of this hotel, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that sounds a bit, nah. So I spoke to some artists I know in the UK. One of them is actually from Australia originally. And he's like, nah, man, don't show there. That's like... That's like saying that you're having a show in Sydney, but it's in Penrith. <laughs> and I was like, which is like Western yeah, Sydney. Yeah, it's not even Sydney. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And I was like, dude, I'm not really happy about this. Like I was sort of blowing up. And he said, oh, what about if we move your show to a different country? And I said, I'd love to show in Taipei. And he's like, oh, yeah, the Gallery Ovo, which I was familiar with. And then they just took over the reins and did a show there, which was successful and a lot of fun. But it was super weird just, like, it being problem solved that quick and just yeah. moving it to a completely different part of the world and still doing the show. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, that's such a cool, like, concept, I guess. Like, because not many people would get to experience something like that. In, in yeah. S- and to see the efficiency of someone who obviously must be pretty well known in the art scene to just be like, yeah, bang, don't worry about it, sorted. <laughs> yeah, I'll just hit, I'll hit up the gallery owners over there. They've got a spot in, like, you know, a couple months. They can fit you in. Two weeks show, no problem. That's crazy. It's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. What about? I, I want to touch on um, this child drawing that you that you mentioned a f- couple minutes ago. Oh, G Grub. Yeah, G Grub. What's the? How, how did that come about? And and how is that? I guess is it kind of like your spirit spirit child who just who <laughs> like continues on throughout the art throughout your art. Um, kind of like it started back when I was. I don't know. I must have been drawing him since I was like 10. But when I was in uh, high school, it must be grade nine or whatever, when you do work experience, um, I wanted to do work experience with Yoram Gross. They're an um, animation studio in Australia. I think at the time they were one of the only ones. They did like um, Blinky Bill and Dot and the Kangaroo and all that Blinky sort of Bill stuff. Blinky Bill is the greatest TV show. It's one of the yeah. greatest TV shows. Actually. Epic. And, um, you know, so they, they did those really iconic sort of 80s um, cartoons. And so to get work experience, you had to send some of your illustrations to them and be like, hi, I'm 
Aaron Craig, I'm 15 <laughs> or 14 or whatever, and I wanted to come do work experience with you guys. I, they didn't accept me, but I, I ended up drawing a lot of G-Grub for that because I was like, I really need to have my own original character. Um, and so, and I really loved the design of him. I thought it was pretty unique. Um, and then it's, I've only started bringing him back into my work in like the last two years. So I'm like, because I do so much like heavy handed cartoon stuff, I feel like it makes, like it's a natural transition for me to incorporate my own character or characters uh, into my paintings over time. So a lot of my paintings now, I try and use G-Grub, even commissions and stuff as one of the core characters. Um, That's that circle guy, yeah? Yeah, yeah, with the horns, with the rings on the horn. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how that started and, and now it's sort of like a, a focus of mine. So my LS show was going to be really ba- – like it was going to be based only on G-Grub, but I've since decided against that and I'll slowly incorporate him in more shows and then I'm hoping maybe the end of next year. I already have my shows for next year booked out. I have, I've like planned, I have one in LA and then I have one in Melbourne to finish the year, so maybe the Melbourne one might be very – G grub, that'd be so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. Like, so it's, I've, I've included him as like, you know, the a lot of paintings and digital illustrations and NFTs and stuff mm-hmm. as well. So it's, it's it's nice to sort of revisit that character that I had back thirty years ago. Now, do you ever put like a personality to your to your like paintings, like this G grub character? Do you ever put like a personality to it when you're drawing? Like, do you certain colors that you use might like be the mood that that character's in at the time um yeah i mean his definitely if i'm painting him but not in his normal form like he's like mickey mouse he's always a color yeah mickey mouse is always black you know with the skin colored face yeah happy white gloves (laughs) so like g grub is always black and white and gray it's like a grayscale character he doesn't have any color which i really like like and i think um he has sort of like this old timey um, rubber hose American style animation aesthetic to him, and um, which was not, I actually painted him for a designer con uh, uh, American classic animation show, which is cool. That's sick. Um, so he d- he has that aesthetic for a reason, um, but when I paint him in actual paintings, yeah, his color changes. So it was stuff. like a painting I did recently with him. He's like orange you know with like yellow horns and like having blue eyes and stuff so it's like very it changes over time depending on what i'm wanting out of the painting like that painting was supposed to be super playful like it was all about adventure so it kind of made more sense for there yeah. to be a lot of color injected into it yeah do you find that I don't, I don't really know if this works but like when you when you're doing an art gallery it do there, is there like a certain set of rules that you kind of have to abide by when you're painting, or is it? Do you or like do you have a certain theme that you're trying to like portray whilst? When yeah, yeah. Like and then and like in the setup when you do have these, like if that is the case, do you set them up along the wall in a certain way so like it kind of like the mood will follow the whole wall around? If that makes sense. Um. <coughs> well, the first part of that, so. The stipulations from the gallery are generally just to fill the space. So they'll give you wall dimensions, um, you know, that they would like filled. So you can then break that down mathematically to how many paintings or what size you want to paint. Like a lot of my paintings, I don't, I don't paint that big. You know, some, like I think my biggest painting I've ever done is like one and a half metres by like a metre. Like this size. I think that's one and a half by, yeah, it's a metre by a metre maybe. That'd be about a metre by a metre, I reckon, yeah. So, so like, make that a rectangle. Yeah. Add, like, another half on top. That's, like, the, probably the biggest painting I've ever painted. Actually, no, I did a two metre by two metre tondo, like, circle. So that's the biggest painting I've ever done. Yeah. So, but s- relatively s- small. Similar, yeah. Um, and that's, like, I don't paint a lot of those. Like, I paint them more as commissions than pieces for shows. Um, so for me, I kind of have to break down like how many paintings am I going to do? So like for the LA show, I've already started painting for it. I've painted forty paintings for it already. That's crazy. But they're but they're quite small. They're like twenty one centimeters by twenty one centimeters, and then they have like just the core character in the middle. It's like a series I called I call Ham Radio, which was the title of my first solo show. And so 
I want to paint 50 of those because in my head I can see how they'll be displayed on the wall. You know what I mean? And I think they'll yeah. look amazing all together. And But then I need to then work on the bigger paintings that accompany that. So you sort of break down the space once it's, once they give it to you. Um, yeah, that's kind of how... That's the only real stipulation that a gallery gives you. In terms of theme, like, I generally have a, a style. Like, each show I've done has had its own sort of style. So, like, the first show was ham radio, and they were actually painted on QSL ham radio cards, which were, are like, oh, you'd probably be interested. They're, like, the old radio cards from, bef- like, pre-commercial radio time. So, people had a lot of people had just, like, their bootleg yeah. amateur radio setups in their house yeah and so they used to um send a transmission out and if someone received it on the other end they would go receiving you in say tokyo and they'd go and everyone had their own radio station qsl card yeah and it would usually have imagery and their radio station on it and they're super cool like the yeah. designs on some of these things are phenomenal like from a Graphic design background, like these are just amateur people that are putting these things together usually, and some like, of them are sick. Like pirate radio, super like, cool. It's so yeah. sick, and they like just whack an antenna on top of the like the highest building they can find. It's and they just like break yeah. into building. Yeah, it's super cool, it man. So sick. It's um, and uh, and so I have all these cards, and so I painted these characters on all these cards, and they were displayed. So that that's one style of painting that I have, and that's what I'm revisiting in this new show. But then the second show was like very um cartoony like i wanted it to be specifically um a blend of cartoons and comics so it had like a lot of um i'm like a ma- like a massive comic nerd so had like a lot of marvel comic like vintage sort of um characters blended in with like classic cartoons so that was what that whole show was and then my last show in taipei was called short stories so it was all just no comic characters but all cartoons again but sort of like blended and put into these scenarios that they couldn't exist in so like you know snoopy would be with like um mr messy from the mr man books oh yeah okay in, yeah. in a scene and i would have the scene imagine and then i would imagine what the story was that they were in and so then i recorded i wrote like a short story for each painting and then i recorded me narrating the short story that i oh. wrote about the painting and then they had a um qr code on each painting. Yeah, and you could like scan it and find it. So the people story. would be walking around the gallery and they'd scan it and I would narrate the story of the painting to them while they were looking at it. That's I thought so it was a really sick. cool. Concept. Yeah, that's really sick. That's so sick. That was fun. So that that was my like last one. And that's like my three solo shows that I've done. So they all they've all been distinctly different, but sort of like you you could tell they're all done by the same person. Yeah. Um and then this one I'm sure will probably have a completely new element to it at in some point, probably when I get to the bigger paintings. So if anyone from LA is listening, what <laughs> what date is this going to be going down? Oh, it's in May. I can't remember the uh, late May. It'll be there on for I think three weeks, and it's at um, Gallery nineteen eighty eight in West Hollywood. So make sure you get their team. <laughs> yeah, I actually everyone in everyone in LA. I do get people from America now. Like I actually get people all over the world listening to this. Sick. It's wild. That's amazing. I, lo- I looked up the stats yesterday, and there was people in like Africa, Asia. Oh, can you um, s- see where people are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It tells me on like my web on the page that like the company that I used to like distribute everything. I could say. Yeah, it was like America, Canada. Like it was literally everywhere. I even had someone from Russia. I was wow, like, this is crazy. That's <laughs> epic. Yeah, I was so I was so uh, honored to like have people come on and listen. Oh, and, good like, on you. It's crazy to think that you could just see things grow, mate. Just put it out. I there. bet your first one, your first one was probably all just like local people, yeah, new and was. stuff. And yeah, it just seems to be like things take yeah, time. Like those pirate radios, man, just bouncing out, yeah. hitting everyone. <laughs> Plant a seed. What's that? What's that saying from um, Field of Dreams? If we build it, they will come. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is it Field of Dreams? I think it is. Oh, I've not. Kevin Costner. I know what you're talking about. It's <laughs> but I guess yeah, coming towards the end of this this podcast, there's so much. I, I feel like we need to get you back on again because it's, there's so much that we can chat about. Like this, like we could break down more shows and. But I guess for. Future, like obviously you got this LA show coming up. How, d- like, w- when you set your price point and things for your art, w- what do you kind of like going into it? How do you kind of, because I don't really know how people justify like when they put their price on there and things the like price that. Tag. Um, well, it changes, you know, like the uh, the price goes up over time. 
essentially. Yeah. So, like, the more shows you do, I think um, the more exposure you have, the more collectors you have, um, the price naturally keeps going up in that yeah. regard. So I think pricing work is one of the hardest things for any artist. And because I own an art company, um, I've been asked by a lot of other artists that are my peers about the price of their work. It, do you think that's suitable? Literally every show I curate, I have at least, say, between three and ten artists in that show that would say, oh, what do you think? Is this price suitable? Or do you need to change it to be more in line with other people? You know what I mean? Just so like, shows of people's prices are fluid, which I don't... I don't think that's great. You know what I mean? Like, I think you should know your value and your value should come from um, past work that you've sold, who you've sold it to, who you've shown with, galleries you've shown with, um, and then other people that have shown at those galleries. So these are all the things I was talking about, raising your profile. Yeah. You know? So for me, it for me also pricing my work in terms of, like, commissions, it comes down to, like, time, you know, um, time and material costs. So I, I like to be paid well for my time. You know, like I don't want to paint and get paid twenty dollars an hour in, because that's yeah. shit. Because in my head, I'm thinking, like, you don't like your your funding. Like the money that comes in must only come in at short amounts. Like it's not like you go to work every week and you just got continuous flow of cash coming in. So. Mm. For someone to put in so much time and effort into their art, they should be justified by the price. Like, they should be allowed to put a certain price point on it because that might be their show for, like, that show that comes in and then after that, that might be their their money to last them for, like, another show or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? It's usually, like, there's a lot of revenue streams for artists. It's not just, like, I'm selling that painting and yeah. if I don't sell a painting, I'm fucked. Like, it's not. Oh, okay. It's kind of like, like, the shows are good because they're a bulk payment. You know what I mean? Like, if you sell out a show and you get paid really well from the gallery, so you might get, you know, thousands of dollars in your account. Um, but, like, for me, you know, I still have an art company that I own and run, which pays quite well because it sells a lot of stuff out pretty quick. Um, I own a pin manufacturer company. So, like, I like little lapel pins, yep. which I've owned for six, seven years. So, I do that and I have like a lot of cl- like recurring clients I do uh, commercial work for people so I just I did all the Daniel John's merch for his yeah I saw that album. you were down there doing that something with him I was like that looks pretty cool yeah so Sony BMG uh, I've been working with them since like December last year so I did like a lot of his merch for his latest album release um, and then it's just like there's uh, there's a lot of other you know little things that you get invited to throughout the year you know, like this year I did like a Master of the Universe show. Got You get money for that. You know, stuff with the Chicago Bulls, you get money for that. You get a lot of commissions. Like I, if I do a painting and put it on my Instagram, I usually get a request to buy it. Yeah, right. So yeah, okay. I, I can choose to sell it right there and then if I want to. Like literally every ham radio painting I share, someone asks to buy it and I have to say no. Because if I keep selling them, I'm going to have nothing to show in LA. <laughs> so uh, even though I know I can get double the amount of money right now for that painting, I have to be like, you know, I'll, okay, I'll only get this much next in a year. Yeah. And that hype that that person that really wanted it right now in a year's time, Still six months' it. time, maybe they don't want it anymore. Or they don't want to pay for it to be shipped from America. Yeah. So, like, you might even lose that person, but you kind of have to be you – know, you've got to – Pick what you're going to do. You can't just go. So, that yeah, that I think as a creative, you, you can't just be like, I'm only painting and that's my source of income. If that was, uh, like, if that was my thing, then I would still do, like, I'd still be able to live, but I wouldn't be able to, you know, be as comfortable as I am at the moment, you know, which is what I want for my family, to be comfortable. So, yeah. And I reckon, like, making making, like, a... A hobby or like a passion profitable is the hardest thing to do. But it can be done. It can be done. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm going to get you back on because there's so much more we could discuss. But the batteries are dying and I I think I've got someone else coming on very soon. But before we get out of here, my young friend, 
There are two things we like to do. The first thing is you get a shout out a local legend who you think should come on the show. And the second thing is, is you get to give a piece of advice to anyone listening right now who might need a bit of motivation to start their creative project. <laughs> okay. Um, the first person that should come on the show, um, I don't know, maybe she's been on already, Mika Shetty? Yep, already had her on. Have you? Good friend of mine. Yeah. Love you, Mika. She, uh, she should definitely come on. Well, maybe again. again. <laughs> yeah. I need to watch that one. Yeah. I haven't seen none there. Come on, get on. The, get on. I'm, pretty, I'm covering the whole coast. I'm just <laughs> take, take, knocking them down. Um, no. Okay, my mate Alison Mooney. No, nah, haven't had her on. Oh, she definitely get she, on. She, Alison Mooney is with the refinery. Is that correct? Um, well, she's an artist. Yeah, she's an foremost, artist. So yeah. she, uh, she has something to do with her. I the think refinery. that's. Like, I think I, that's how I met. I got. I've, I think I've had a conversation with her through. Yeah, now. yeah. She's super cool. Um, but she's very knowledgeable in, you know, curation. She ran an art space in Toowoomba um, and has been involved in a lot of things, even council here. You know, she worked at the Calandra Regional Gallery for a while. So, and she also shares at galleries and is represented yeah. by a gallery. All right, Alison. So she's, uh, yeah, she definitely would be uh, a wealth of knowledge. So, uh, yeah, I'd hit up her. Um, advice for... What was that segment? You, you just get to give a piece of advice to someone who might need a bit of a kick in the ass to start their project. No one personal, just like if someone was to, if you were to give any advice to anyone, a creative in general, what would it be? Oh, treat, like it, treat it like a job. Yeah. Creatives are so, most people don't believe in themselves enough to treat it like a job to begin with. So I think that's the, the biggest thing, you know. Um, lack of professionalism in the creative industries pretty up there you know this is i've this is from curating probably more than 30 shows over like the last six years um and dealing with like a lot of artists on releases that most people aren't on time you know a bit tardy with with deadlines um don't know how to promote themselves you know what i mean let's just like take it seriously and i think that that's something that a lot of people Skip over. If you don't treat it like a job, no one's going to pay you. See? Full of knowledge. Oh, my God. This is amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Aaron. No worries. Thanks this for having been, me. Yeah. This has been another amazing episode of Creative Appetite. You know what to do. Please like, ship, ship, share. Ship, share. Uh, ship, ship share. share and subscribe. <laughs> Please uh, ship, share and subscribe. <laughs> Tell your grandma about it. Hang around for the next one. Let's go. See you.